Welcome back, my wonderful viewers. Today, we're going to talk about baromenology. Baromenology is an attempted science invented by creationists that works similarly to taxonomy. However, there is a major difference between the two. For starters, let's define baromenology. According to Wikipedia, baromenology classifies animals into groups called created kinds, or baromen, according to the account of creation in the book of Genesis and other parts of the Bible. It claims that kinds cannot interbreed and have no evolutionary relationship to one another. I decided to devote a video to this topic because I'd seen it on such websites as Answers in Genesis, and it's been a part of two videos so far. Thus, I think debunking it in a single video is the best course of action. With an idea of what baromenology is, let's define taxonomy. It's defined as the branch of science concerned with classification, especially of organisms, systematics. The very earliest attempts at taxonomy that we know of came from the ancient Egyptians, and later, the Greek philosopher Aristotle had quite a large hand in classifying organisms. Arabic scholars and even the Roman Pliny the Elder created various systems of classification, but all these attempts had a fundamental flaw in their design, one that would even befuddle the father of modern taxonomy, Carolus Linnaeus. The flaw was that all pre-Darwinian attempts at taxonomy were made by discontinuous minds, as Richard Dawkins called them, that is, those who were unaware of evolution. In Linnaeus' day, evolution hadn't yet been discovered, so the pre-Darwinian taxonomists couldn't be faulted for their ignorance. However, we now live in a world where evolution is an inescapable fact. Thus, creationist attempts at taxonomy, that is, baromenology, cannot logically stand. Answers in Genesis, a paragon of creationist absurdity, has written several articles on baromenology that try to make it sound scientific. For example, the article Barrow What? by Todd Wood says, open quote, The modern field of baromenology attempts to identify those created kinds using sophisticated mathematical formulas to identify categories of creatures. We think these categories are likely the categories that Adam originally used, even if they might look different today. End quote. For starters, one would have to know virtually nothing about population genetics to seriously consider the ludicrous notion that the entire human race went through two population bottlenecks in the span of about 2,000 years. If we did, then we would not just be clones of each other, we would not be. Cheetahs went through a very serious bottleneck about 12,000 years ago, and as such, they are very genetically similar to each other today. Now, their bottleneck resulted in a major loss of genetic diversity, but it wasn't anywhere near the magnitude of bottlenecking that the creationists proclaim. Such incestuous breeding for so long would destroy humanity, but creationists have absolutely no problem believing that humanity twice survived generations of incestuous breeding. Here's what the Cheetah Conservation Fund has to say on the matter. Open quote, This event caused an extreme reduction of the cheetah's genetic diversity, known as a population bottleneck, resulting in the physical homogeneity of today's cheetahs. Poor sperm quality, focal palatine erosion, susceptibility to the same infectious diseases, and kinked tails characteristic of the majority of the world's cheetahs are all ramifications of the low genetic diversity within the global cheetah population. End quote. These facts alone already disprove any attempt at science based on a genesis creation, but there are even more problems with baromenology. Looking at the quote I pulled from Answers in Genesis again, it says that it attempts to classify organisms even if they look differently today than they did when they were created. Well, if they plan on doing that, then they must have some method for doing so. What is that method? Cruising a little lower down the page, we find this. Open quote. One of the most innovative techniques developed to study created kinds is a statistical comparison of species morphology structure. The first step is to identify the distinct characteristic traits of the species then enter them into a statistical program that compares the similarity or dissimilarity among the species, called baromenic distance, end quote. Well, that sounds quite scientific, right? I mean, they're using a statistical probability to figure out their relationships among organisms. Evolutionary biologists do that too. Oh wait, in saying that they only use morphology to statistically determine their relationships among organisms, they seem to have forgotten the fact that biologists are able to use DNA to classify organisms. Using solely morphologies to classify organisms, their method is neither innovative nor entirely correct. Examples proving this are the red panda, edentates, and insectivora. The red panda was grouped with the giant panda and all other bears until DNA proved that the red panda was more closely related to raccoons. Second, edentates contain xenarthra, comprised of anteater sloths and armadillos, and pangolins, which look a lot like armadillos. But DNA placed pangolins within a whole different superorder of mammals. Pangolins are moved from the armadillo's close cousin to its distance cousin. Third, insectivora was a clade comprised of many small miscellaneous insectivorous mammals, but the group became known as Eulopotyphla when some of its members turned out to be Afrotherians. DNA is currently the undisputed best way to figure out relationships among organisms. Okay, maybe this is just one radical creationist and not a good cross-section of what creationists think about baromenology. Let's instead use the creationist molecular geneticist Georgia Purdom. Since she understands the importance of DNA, she'll probably make a good case for baromenology. She says in the article she wrote titled, Variety Within Created Kinds, open quote, Since two of each kind of land animal and seven of some were brought aboard the ark for the purpose of preserving their offspring upon the earth, Genesis 7-3, 
it seems clear that a kind represents the basic reproductive boundary of an organism. That is, the offspring of an organism is always the same kind as its parents, even though it may display considerable variation, end quote. This actually sounds like a good definition of kinds because it's supported by science, although we already have a word that means the basic reproductive boundary of an organism. It's called species. What makes a species is, at least according to the biological species concept, the ability or inability to successfully breed with other organisms and produce fertile offspring, or offspring that are themselves capable of reproduction. In the case of hybrids, crosses between two different species of the same genus, most offspring are infertile, showing that the production of fertile offspring almost exclusively occurs on the species level. Purdom, however, equates the basic reproductive boundary of an organism with the family taxonomic level. But we can't mate two organisms that are related only at the family level and higher. Otherwise, humans would be able to produce fertile offspring with chimpanzees. We know that we can't. Purdom continues, open quote, Creation researchers have found that kind is often at the level of family in our modern classification scheme. However, there is no reason to assume a one-to-one -one correspondence between our man-made system and the biblical terminology. So kind may be at a higher taxonomic level in some cases and lower in others, end quote. Essentially, kind in this context has no meaning. It may be family sometimes, species others, and genus other times. In this case, there isn't a viable definition of kind, just some vague pseudoscientific mumblings. Continuing with the article, Purdom says, open quote, God placed the potential for tremendous variety within the original created kinds. This original variation, altered by genetic mutations and other mechanisms after the fall, such as natural selection, led to the great diversity of living things we see today, end quote. I wondered about the implications of this concerning the number of animals before and after the mythical global flood. Fortunately, Ken Ham answered my thoughts in his debate with Bill Nye. He said that 7,000 pairs of animals got off the ark and basically evolved into all the animals we see today. Nye said there are about 16 million species of animals. Nye countered by pointing out that if this were so, then we should expect nearly 11 species of animal to appear per day, which is clearly an unreasonable expectation. Nonetheless, Nye's calculation showed an enormous flaw both in the number of animal pairs that Ham chose and the idea of kinds. We then must contend with the concept of which animals have existed from the beginning and which animals evolved after the Ark. The problem is that this question can't be solved by baromenology either. How do we decide which animal pairs gave birth to each kind? Could we simply look at the common denominator of characteristics that each kind of organism has to determine what animals gave birth to the kind? No. Think of cats. Felids share very many similarities, so how would we be able to determine which one gave rise to the others? Could we just guess? That's not scientific. The only answer to this question is DNA. DNA is able to tell us that the lion is most closely related to the leopard, is less related to the jaguar, than the tiger, snow leopard, clouded leopard, marbled cat, etc. Returning to Purdom's article, the bottom of it has a picture showing the common ancestry of some cats. The phylogeny in the picture is wrong, but that's not the point. Again, Purdom shows her erroneous belief that all modern cats, with their long lifespans, could have come into existence over the course of 4,000 years from a single pair of cats. I doubt there would be any cats, or any animals for that matter, if all modern animals except fish are descended from just pairs of animals a few thousand years ago. In any case, the linking power has, of DNA has been conspicuously avoided, perhaps because creationists know its existence supports evolution. We must realize that creationism is an untenable position, not supported by any science. That is why it doesn't deserve a place in the science classroom and is only upheld by individuals perpetuating strawman arguments, lies, and misrepresentations of actual science. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you later.